I'm really thrilled to be here today to talk to you about the CARES Act. There's been a lot of um, a, a lot going on, particularly with this, and I think the most important thing is that my goal here is to cut through all of the verbiage that is out there and give you the information you need to make good decisions about your business. Um, we've got a lot to go through, so um, I'm going to go ahead and actually get started uh, First off, we're gonna really focus on, particularly for your business, what you can be doing. And today you are in the right place. If you are an S Corp, a C Corp, an LLC, if you are a sole proprietor, a solo entrepreneur, if you are a 1099 a, a consultant, if you work for the gig economy, um, any of these individuals, you are in the right place place. So we're going to be talking about these different programs. I'm going to give you some pitfalls to, advise, to avoid and then open it up for questions. We may not have time for questions um, because I know that we have so much to go through, but um, I can also give you my email so that you can email me um, and we can always uh, you know, go back and forth or jump on the phone. So let's go ahead and do that. So there's a lot going on. Um, Essentially, where we are today, uh, social distancing measures have been extended out until the end of April. Um, and because of this, stocks fell slightly, although today, um, and today is April 6th, Monday, um, the market is actually up quite significantly. Um, but what we can say <laughs> is that the market has been volatile. Interestingly enough, last week, um, it was a little calmer. Um, I'm not saying that it was calm, but it was a little calmer versus uh, the week before. And part of the reason why it was calmer is that the Federal Reserve has been doing everything they can, um, offering as many tools as possible to support the economy. And part of that is easing capital requirements for big banks to allow them to make more loans. What that fancy easing capital requirements, it means that they have to have less money in their coffers um, to be able to offer loan. So typically there's a, a, a loan to kind of cash value that they are required to have. But what we're seeing um, because of the SPA requirements um, being eased, they can have fewer dollars in house and able to loan more money. And that's really important for you as a business owner. Um, so what's interesting, we're going to be going through um, you know what the stimulus package is but what's interesting and what I'm seeing and it just makes my heart really happy is that there's bipartisan interest and support for a fourth a fourth round of stimulus and um, you know they are going back and forth of what it's going to look like speaker Nancy Pelosi, Pelosi is uh, floating a few ideas um, in addition to the this stimulus package actually focusing on rolling back um, the restriction on salt taxes and what that means is the taxes that we as New Yorkers could deduct that we pay the high state taxes that we pay the high local taxes that we pay and the high real estate taxes that we pay and many of us had real significant tax bites back in 2019 because many of the taxes that we pay, we can't deduct. Any portion above $10,000, we can't deduct. So a lot of us got really hurt. And so Nancy Pelosi, that is one of the things that she is looking to repeal, which means that there would be a huge tax uh, benefit to all of us New Yorkers. So I Ha ha, <laughs> definitely, definitely behind that. Um, and President Trump also wants, uh, is, is part of this fourth stimulus package. And for his package, he's really focusing on rebuilding the U.S. through infrastructure spending, um, essentially repairing roads, repairing bridges, being able to create tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of jobs through this stimulus package. So the good news is, is that it's not over and that we still have more to come. So now we're going to get started with the Keep American Workers Paid 
and Employment Act. It's called the CARES Act, which I love that acronym. Um, there's not much that comes out of the government that makes me feel warm and fuzzy, but um, the name, the acronym, the CARES, the acronym uh, CARES Act definitely does make me feel nice and warm and fuzzy. Um, and you will too when you realize how much this can actually support you as well as your business. We're going to be covering two pieces of this in particular for businesses. First, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and that's where we're going to spend most of our time, partially because it has the highest benefits for you, and also, unfortunately, it's the most complex and misunderstood. And then we're also going to go through the Emergency Economic Injury Disaster Loans Program. And what's special about this presentation that I haven't seen before is that I'm going to go through the details of, of what this all means. Um, but I want you to walk away with knowing what your next step is. So I'm actually going to go through the application and I'm going to show you how to fill it out. I'm going to show you how you reply, what banks you can apply with so that you can walk away with doing something with us. Because I've, I've probably listened to five or six presentations because the, the payroll protection, uh, the paycheck protection program, um, I've, spent probably 50 hours diving through the 850 pages that were written about it. And I've attended so many sessions and seminars um, about this given by other experts like myself. But the piece I've seen missing is the, well, that's great, but how do I do this? And so I actually have applied for myself, for Francis Financial. I've also applied for our charity, Savvy Ladies. So I know what it's like because, bless, I have lived it. So let's dive on in. Um, you'll see that I refer to the Paycheck Protection Program as the PPP loan. Um, just so you know, it's the same thing. It's just it's a little bit of a mouthful to be keeping in saying the Paycheck Protection Program. So um, you'll see here and there, I'll refer to it as uh, the PPP loan program. All right, so here is the, here's like the highlights. Um, essentially focused for small businesses. It's meant to cover qualified costs, and we'll talk about what those costs are that it should be used for. Um, this is the most important right here. The loans can be converted to grants. In other words, what this is saying is that this loan can be forgiven. Not only the principal, the amount that you take out, but any of the interest that is accrued. Now, what's special about this is this is available to pretty much anyone who has a business and they're not requiring you to personally guarantee it or put up any type of collateral. And the other thing to know is that you can only apply once for your tax ID number. So that means that if you apply for let's say $25,000 and then you realize you really need 50,000 and you go to put a second loan in, you can't. So you need to make sure that whatever you're applying for is the it's right dark, amount and what most people what most people are doing is they're applying for the maximum amount that's what they're they're doing which makes makes a lot of sense a lot of sense so when should you apply the answer is immediately immediately um, they say the applications can be submitted through june 30th but it's only going to be available for you until the funds are exhausted. And the scary, the scary thing is that there are some experts out there saying that by the end of this week, this program could be exhausted. Now, it's a lot of money. It's $349 billion. And as of this weekend, um, only 13 banks had links available to be able to take applications. And despite that small amount, by Friday last week, they had already given $5.4 billion, and they had already processed over 17,000 loans. So this is important <clears throat> for you to know. Um, if you're an independent contractor, they're saying that you can start to apply on April 10th. Um, I will tell you what I'm telling people do, to do if you're a 1099, if you um, are a gig economy independent contractor, I would just apply as soon as you possibly can. 
um, you know, maybe they they put you in the queue to not look at your application till then, but at least at least apply, at least apply. So what is a small business? <clears throat> Who's qualified? Um, so a small business is in general 500 employees or less. Now what's interesting is that the way they're counting employees is not the company in aggregate, but by premises. So um, a good example might be a McDonald's. McDonald's um, is a, you know, may have a hundreds and hundreds of thousands of workers in total, but they will look at it branch by branch of McDonald's. And really what's interesting about McDonald's is most of those branches are independent owners, they're, they're franchisees. So those franchisees of those individual uh, McDonald's may actually be able to benefit from this too. If you are in certain industries, they've actually uh, eased the standard, the size that's needed, so that if you have more than 500 employees, you still may qualify. And uh, we put this wonderful link for you. You can go right to the SBA website, sba.gov, size standards, for additional details to see if your business is, um, if it is larger, if you still qualify. Now, eligibility, this is really important. And this is what, this is what keeps me up at night. This is what keeps me up at night. The number and types of individuals that are able to benefit from this program is nothing like we've ever really seen in history. It's exhaustive, the number of people who can benefit. And the challenge is, is that a good number of individuals don't realize that they can benefit. And so what I, I want you to do is I want you to make sure that you understand what this means, not only for yourself, but you need to share this information with the people that you love. So for example, sole proprietors can benefit, self-employed individuals, independent contractors, 501c3, so charities, and 501c19, not nonprofit organizations with 500 or fewer employees. And I've had questions about what is an independent contractor. So an independent contractor, you know you are that person if you are getting 1099s from your clients. If you're self-employed, it might just be you. It might just be you and you don't have more than one employee. That is fine, you still qualify. But, but you had to be in business with payroll expenses and salaries that you were responsible for, even if they were to yourself. You had to be in business February 15th, 2020. Now, for the vast majority of people, that's not a problem. But what the government is doing is they're making sure that people aren't taking advantage of this program, starting a business, getting a loan that is then forgiven when they never had a business before the coronavirus situation started, significantly impacting revenue of small businesses. So that's important. You have to have been in a business February 15th, 2020. Who's not eligible? Well. The first one, you wouldn't be surprised. So if you are engaging in a business that has a legal activity, guess what? <laughs> no surprise, you're not eligible. Um, but the second one, you may be um, not as, comf you know, realizing as much, but if you have a nanny or a housekeeper, anyone that you pay on the books, you too are not eligible. And that is because you are actually not a business, right? You're not a business. So that's why you cannot get the PPP loan program for covering the salaries of any nannies or housekeepers that, or, or household employees that you might have. If uh, you have an owner, a 20% owner or more, who is either incarcerated, on probation, on parole, or has been convicted of a federal a fel a felony in the last five years, you are not uh, going to be able to participate in this, or if you've defaulted or are currently delinquent on any SBA or federal agency loans um, in the last seven years. That too would prohibit you. So how much money can you get from this? 
Um, and don't worry, I have um, I have a couple examples to show you how this is all calculated. But it's the the maximum loan size is the lesser of either ten million dollars or two and a half times your average monthly qualified costs for the last twelve months. So for the majority of us, for the majority of us it's going to be this section. It's going to be two and a half times the monthly qualified costs for the last 12 months. I know that that's what I am qualified for. Now, what you're thinking right now, and, and I, I don't want to read your mind because that's always a little scary, but you're probably wondering what are qualified costs. So don't worry. I've laid them all out for you here. Um, a couple of them you're not going to be surprised by, but some you will be surprised that you can include for that qualified cost. Um, so salary and wages, so qualified costs that you've paid uh, for salary and wages for yourself or employees, but it's also extended to commissions. And I think this is really interesting, cash tips. So the <laughs> The IRS and the Small Business Administration, they're actually, bless them, they're, they're admitting to that a lot of people are getting cash tips that they're not paying taxes on. So uh, what they're saying, if you have documentation to you know, back up the cash tips, great. If not, then they're saying, we'll just have your best guess, which I think is really, really phenomenal. Um, also, any payments that you have made as an employer for vacation pay, um, parental, family, medical, or sick leave. Uh, any payments that you as an employer are paying for uh, employees or yourself for group health care coverage or other insurance premiums. Any payments you are making uh, as an employer for your employees or yourself for retirement benefits, such as uh, profit sharing. And I just made uh, profit sharing contributions uh, two weeks ago to my employees that is considered into their retirement accounts. Um, now, some of you may not do profit sharing uh, and give that to your employees. Some people, what they'll do is they'll match the contributions that their employees are making to their 401ks so that if the uh, employee puts in a dollar, you might match up to 50% of that, so 50 cents. And that, too, is considered the qualified um, payroll cost. Um, also, as employers, we pay typically state and local taxes on the compensation of an employee, so on those employee wages, that too can be used as qualifying as a payroll cost. And unfortunately, if you've had to, uh, you know, let go of someone, terminate someone over the last 12 months, the financial benefit that you might have paid out to them in the form of severance or, or some other type of benefit, um, that too can be included in, oh, again, payroll costs. So. The, the amount is, you know, what you're including is pretty darn liberal. And I, I do have to say that the challenge is, is that this is a whole lot. Um, digging up all this information is, is pretty, pretty much a, a big time, you know, job. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to get this information. But before we do, I want to tell you what doesn't qualify. So if you are paying an employee whose principal place of residence is outside of the United States, you cannot use their compensation as part of that qualified payroll cost. Just not going to happen. And the reasoning, and you'll see that this is a question that they ask actually on the form, um, are any of your employees res you know, living outside the United States, uh, their principal place of residence is outside the United States? And if you click yes, then they're going to, look at your payroll and make sure that you're not including any payroll for that person because these dollars are truly meant to help Americans. Um, also, the compensation of any individual in employee in excess of an annual salary of 100000 So I want you to listen to this because it, it can be very confusing. You can include the salaries of employees that you have or yourself that make more than $100,000. You can include that. But any portion that's above the $100,000, you're disallowed. So the maximum you can, can be able to include is $100,000. So if an employee makes $300,000, you can put 
on that plan on your qualified payroll costs as a hundred thousand you have to say goodbye to that two hundred thousand you're not allowed to claim that that portion also if you have independent contractors that you pay so last year we uh, we did a bunch of videos for Francis Financial. It was about $15,000 that we had to pay, and we paid that to an outside company. And when it came to tax time, we had to issue a 1099 so that they had documentation to do their taxes. So I can't claim that $15,000 in my qualified payroll. However, the video company that received the $15,000 received that and the 1099, they can claim it on their payroll costs. So essentially what, what's so special about this program is that if you're an independent contractor, like the amazing woman that we worked with, that we paid that $15,000, she can apply because most likely her her business and her income have plummeted. So she can apply and use that $15,000 for her calculation of payroll costs for her loan. But I can't, but I can't. So this does create a challenge for business owners who have employee, they're not employees, they're people that are 1099s, you could call them freelancers, whatever you want to. But some people pay out 50, 60, even $200,000 a year to these people who do a significant amount of work for them. But because they're not getting wages, bonus, commission, because they are 1099s, that business owner can't claim them. Instead, that person, that person that works for you, that you're paying maybe $50,000, not, and they're not an employee, you're paying them as a 1099, as a freelancer, what they can do is that they can apply for their own PPP loan. So there's a lot of confusion around that, and I hope I was able to explain that in a way that makes sense. So I have an example. I have two examples actually here. So this is a company um, that I worked with and no employees make more than $100,000. And there are two employees here. And over the last 12 months of payroll, if you look at that, it's $120,000. And when I say the last 12 months of payroll, it's really important to understand that that is not necessarily the payroll for 2019. There's a lot of confusion because when this first came out, they said whatever your 2019 payroll was, but then they amended it and they left it at the last 12 months. So when I did my application, I looked at March 31st, 2019, all the way through April 1st, 2020. And that's most likely what you're going to need to do, too. So their average monthly payroll, uh, sorry, their average, their, their payroll for the year was 120000 during that 12 months. We divided by 12, so we know that our average monthly payroll is $10,000. And how do we figure out what our loan is? Well, it's just that $10,000 times 2.5. So the amount that this company can qualify for as their maximum loan amount is 25,000. So this is a different scenario. So no, this is a scenario with a larger company and there are a couple, a couple employees that make more than $100,000. So the last 12 month payroll expenses, March 31st through 2019 through April 1st, 2020, the total amount they paid in payroll, and that was, again, not only salary and wages, but health insurance, other insurance, state taxes, local taxes. Um, they actually had to let someone go, so there was a little bit of severance in there as well. Including all of that, it came out to $1.5 million. It's a big nut. So how we help them calculate this 
is it essentially we looked at how much of that is from employees that make more than that hundred thousand dollars and what we were able to see is that there was actually three hundred thousand dollars in excess compensation for those people who make over a hundred over a hundred thousand so we took the 1.5 million minus 300,000. So the qualifying payroll for that 12 months is 1.2 million. So what is our average payroll? Pretty easy, divide it by 12, got $100,000 a month. Our maximum loan amount, 100,000 times 2.5, so $250,000. Great. All right, so what is the loan intended to do? The loan, so once you are qualified, once you get that large lump sum delivered to your checking account, it can be used for these items. Payroll costs, so that includes health insurance, other insurances, uh, employee compensation with you know wages, bonuses, salaries, commissions, mortgage interest obligations, rent, utilities, um, and any interest on debt incurred before the coverage period that you are including. Now, this loan does have interest, and it's capped at 1%. And the maturity date when it needs to be paid back is a two-year maturity date. So really, this information isn't really applicable, the 1% interest rate and the two-year maturity, because if you do it right, if you follow the directions, you can have this 100% forgiven. But there are going to be some people who screw up. There's also gonna be some people who commit fraud with this and you will be found out. So for those people, they will have to pay back the entire principal and then they will also have to pay back the interest that is accrued. So how do you make sure that you're doing this right? Well, I talked a little bit about that the forgiveness can be the full principal plus, plus any accrued interest. And how you make sure you're in the right is that loans will be forgiven that if by June 30th, 2020, a business restores its full-time employment and salary levels to look exactly as they were on February 15th, 2020. So let me say that again. Your loan will be forgiven if by June 30th, 2020, you are able to restore and have your company look as if it did, as it did on February 15, 2020. That means that you had the same number of employees and you had roughly the same salary levels, same compensation for them. The other thing is that only 25% of that loan, so let's say your loan is for $100,000, only 25% or 25,000 can be used for non-payroll costs. So let's go take a look at that. So that means that only 25,000 of the 100,000 that you receive can go towards mortgage interest, rent, utilities, or any interest, uh, any interest paid on debt occurred before the, incurred before the coverage period. The other 75%, 75,000, needs to go right here for payroll costs, employee compensation, healthcare benefits. Why is that? The reason why the government and SBA are making this requirement is they want you to use this money to retain your employees. That is the primary reason that they are passing the Paycheck Protection Program. And so they want to make sure that the majority of the money, 75%, goes towards doing exactly that. Now, there are many people who feel or worry that they don't qualify because they've had to let some or even all of their employees go, and their employees are currently receiving unemployed benefits. You qualify you qualify and what they're saying and we don't have the exact formula yet but they're saying that the loan forgiveness for bringing someone back to the workforce 
as an employee that you had to lay off because of the fallout from the coronavirus, that you actually get an even higher credit, um, essentially better credit, higher kudos and bigger loan forgiveness for doing that. So know that, again, you may unfortunately have had to let go of employees, furlough employees, but it does not preclude you. In fact, if anything, the PPP loans are truly even more important for you and are meant even more so for someone like you. So let's talk a little bit about how your loan forgiveness might be impacted if you can't check all the boxes. So if your employee headcount as of June 30th is less than it was February 15th, 2020, you still will have your loan forgiven, but it will be reduced in a proportional uh, manner. So it doesn't mean that the 100% of that loan you're going to have to pay back. You'll have to pay back some, but there will be a small portion that isn't forgiven that you will have to start to make payments on. Also, if you still, if you do hit that headcount number, let's say you had five employees in February 15th and you're able to have five employees June 30th, and they don't even have to be the same employees, just so you know. They don't even have to be the same employees. They have to be five employees. But if any employee's wages are reduced by more than 25%, then there's also going to be a proportional reduction in the forgiveness. Now, know that this 25 reduction in income for any of your employees doesn't, equal, doesn't apply for all employees. It's specifically for employees making $100,000 or less. And the reason why they're focusing specifically on that population is those are the average Americans. And a 25% reduction in income for those individuals is, is extremely painful. A 25% reduction for someone who's making 500,000, yes, of course, that I'm sure hurts, but nowhere near as significantly so as someone under 100,000. So how do you get your loan forgiven? Um, so you're going to need to keep track and with meticulous details of how you use your loan money. And a best practice would be that whatever account this money goes to, that there's nothing else in it, that you move it to an account that is truly just for the PPP loan. And then use that account to pay for your payroll expenses, your health insurance, rent, utilities. Make sure it comes from that account so that it's just easier to show where the proceeds of that loan went. And what they're going to be looking for is they're going to be looking at the number of employees on payroll and their pay rates for the eight-week period following the date that you get the loan, the date that you get the loan. So again, best practice, best practice is have that come from one account. Don't use several different accounts. I mean, you can, but the burden of proof of having to prove that, it's going to be a lot harder for you. And you are going to need a representative of your business. If you're the owner, it's probably going to be you to certify that you use this money the right way and that the documents you're giving are accurate. And the penalties for, for not being um, upfront and trying to game the system are literally in the six figures. So again, you really want to make sure that you're doing it all right. So this is really important. The best method is to try to use one of these banks on this list. This is the list of SBA loan providers. They are the individuals that have been able to move the quickest on letting individuals apply and starting to fulfill these loans. And if you remember the challenge about this program, while they're accepting applications to June 30th, 2020, I am almost 100% certain that we are going to run out of money far before then, far before then. 
and it's a first come first serve. So when you get your application in is when, when and whether you're going to get this money. So these banks are all up and running with their applications. Um, some of them have not been able to put them online to be able to accept online applications. So I know, um, for example, TD Bank is up and running. Um, I, they are up on their mobile application, but I've heard that they're not yet up on the desktop. Chase is up and running. Bank of America is up and running. Wells Fargo is up and running. Key Bank is up and running. Um, in total, over this last weekend, there were about 13 banks, and most of these should be ready to go and have live links for you to be able to start to fill out that application come today or Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. Um, if your bank is not on this list, like mine, for example, First Republic, I reached out to them to ask when they would be going live, and I asked them on Monday, and they said probably in three to four weeks. Yeah, that's, that's a no-go because this program may well be exhausted with funds by then. So I ended up opening a new account with KeyBank, and you don't even know want to know how, <laughs> how difficult that was. Um, to be able to get into their line, and I was able to get my application in when they went live on Saturday night this weekend at 9 p.m. So try to use one of these banks. Now, unfortunately, what's going to happen is that these banks are going to service their customers first. Then they will get to you. So, for example, Live Oak, I reached out to Live Oak late last week and got on their list. So I got on their list, um, actually it was the week before, so I've been on their list for probably 10 days. And I just got an email this morning saying, we are still working through our current clients, even though you are high on the list, we highly recommend you look at other sources and exhaust all other resources, if possible. So again, time of, is of the essence. If you um, don't have time to write down all, all these, if you just go on SBA loan providers, SBA loan providers, you can get this entire list. So how do you apply? Um, as I mentioned, go to your bank first because you have a relationship. Um, you can reach out to your commercial loan uh, or, or your commercial banker or your personal banker. Um, know that they are crazed. If you call an 800 number, you'll be online waiting forever. It's much better to try and actually work one-on-one -on -one with any contacts you might have. Um, if your bank is not participating, then reach out to one of the SBA's lenders linked here um, that I mentioned. Um, I know that a client uh, or a friend of mine used First Home Bank, and the process was quick and seamless, and she was actually able to do it on Friday. Um, also, make sure that um, you have uh, all the information from yourself and the other owners before you start the process. Um, the other thing that's nice is a lot of them, are, again, because they are online, um, you're going to be able to get e-consents as well as e-signatures from all the different business owners because you do need that on the application. You need e-consent and signatures from all of the business owners that are part of your company. All right, so what do you need? So right here, what I'm showing you is the actual form, uh, form 2483. That's what you're gonna need to fill out. It's the Paytech Protection Program application form. In addition to filling out this form, we wanna make sure that you have documentation. And what this documentation does is it's actually going to prove what your payroll expenses are. So it's going to prove and show, these are my real payroll expenses. The easiest thing to do is to reach out to your payroll processor, whether that happens to be, uh, it could be Heartland, it could be Paychex, um, it could be QuickBooks, it could be Trinet. Um, what I would do is as soon as you're off this call, I would reach out to either your bookkeeper, your accountant, uh, reach out to your payroll processor ASAP to be able to get a copy of this because they are backed up significantly, of course, with all the requests. So get that. Um, you can also look at your tax filings uh, for your business that will show uh, pay payroll tax, um, I'm sorry, the payroll um, costs that you have. Um, if you are a, a independent contractor, a consultant, a freelancer, then you can get your form 1099 miscellaneous um, that 
is sent to you for your taxes. So that's another option. If all else fails and you don't have any of that, you can actually submit bank records that show the bank account that's paying those qualifying payroll amounts. So that's kind of as a last ditch effort because that's a lot to, <laughs> a lot to upload. Um, and the other thing they want you to know, uh, want to know is how you calculated the loan value. Um, in, in the examples before, it was pretty simple. It was just, you know, 100,000 times 2.5. So your loan value is $250,000 that you're eligible for the maximum amount. Um, but you can see based on all the things that can go into of what is considered um, a qualified payroll amount that it's it's not necessarily straightforward. It's salaries, bonuses, commissions, cash tips, health insurance, other insurance, state taxes, local taxes um, that you're paying on behalf of uh, for the payroll that you're you're making. Um, maybe even severance. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of pieces retirement plan contributions, a lot of pieces that go into it, and they want to see how you came up with that magical, magical number. And um, when I submitted online on uh, sun, on Saturday, uh, the link went live around, I think it was like 8.30 or so at night on Saturday night for KeyBank, and I logged in. Um, I was able to actually upload in my application copies of all these things that I needed. So um, again, make sure that you have copies of these things ready to go on your system so that you can upload them if it's required by the bank that you are using. Um, so this is the application and um, the application has changed significantly. Um, this is the most recent application. There's been previous versions. Um, floating around there. But if you go to the sba.gov, that is the place that you should get your application. Because I've seen, um, I've seen outdated applications floating around out there, and you just make sure you use the right application. Um, again, most of, the, most of these banks, it's going to be an online form, but you should still fill this out because you want to have all this filled out, correct, ready to go, so that when you do go to the link and you're able to put your information in, you all you have it all handy there. Um, I will tell you that I had, you know, mine all filled out here, ready to go. And when I went in to start to put the information, I was so nervous, my hands were shaking. Um, because it took me about 150 times refreshing on that link to be able to actually get the application to come up because the number of people that were flooding the system, that the website couldn't handle it. And you'll probably see in the news that there's been a lot of frustrated people because a lot of these websites can't handle the volume, but don't give up. It took me, I don't know, four four hours, three and a half, four hours to submit finally by the number of refreshes, but I finally did. So don't give up and just keep on working to try and do it. And eventually, eventually you will, you will get in. So let's take a look to see how we actually fill this out. Um, the first thing you do need this information um, ready to go, the tax ID number of the business, the social security number of all the owners, as well as their home address. Um, whoever is filling it out, the authorized representative of the business, and if you're the owner, it's probably going to be you, and you're going to be filling this out, um, but you're going to need to include your driver's license uh, number. You're going to have to include uh, also, you know, your date of birth, your social security information, um, and then the average monthly payroll for the last 12 months. So for me, I have that here, and I figured that out, and I figured out what the loan will be, um, and then I also made sure that I had all the documentation I needed to prove how much our payroll really was. And so I had that all ready to go so that when I was going through the form, I could, it actually only took me, once I got in, about 12 minutes to, um, to do. I think it may have taken me a little longer because I was so nervous that I was going to screw it up that I read through it like six times. I even made my husband <laughs> read through it too. Um, so it probably took me a little longer than it might for you, but I just really didn't want to screw up. And so that's why I spent so much time. So this is the form. This is the form. And so up here, you're going to, um, whatever you file your taxes under, whatever entity, that's what you're going to do here. And so um, I did one for Savvy Ladies, which is a 501c3. So I clicked off here, 501c3 nonprofit. 
And um, I also did one for Francis Financial. Francis Financial is a S Corp. Now, if you are an independent contractor, you would click independent contractor. Um, so, you know, pick whatever one is how you file your taxes. If you're not sure, reach out to you, reach out to your accountant. Okay. Now put your business legal name, the business address. Um, you're going to put your tax ID here the business phone number, and the primary contact. And it's probably going to be you, again, especially if you're filling this out, as well as your email address. You're going to put the average monthly payroll. And so in that situation we talked about uh, before, it was uh, essentially $10,000 and then times 2.5. So the amount of the amount that this person could qualify would be for 25,000. And how many employees? If you recall, I said they had two employees. Now, what they're going to be using it for is primarily just payroll. So they clicked off just payroll. And down here, there's only one owner, um, but you'd put the owner's name, their title, their ownership percent, so 100% or whatever that is, um, their social security number, as well as their address. Um, some businesses might have other businesses that own them. And so instead of the social security number for that business, the other owner being a business, you might need to put their tax ID. So here are the gazillion and one small fine print things that I read through a gazillion times to make sure that I was doing it right. But essentially you're acknowledging and saying, I get what this is. I get that if I don't follow the rules, I have to pay it back. I get, I'm not committing fraud, um, you know, da -de da -de da 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 So you are going to initial all these things. And um, the one that I filled out via, T, uh, via KeyBank was via DocuSign. So it was really quick and easy. It was just kind of click, 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 click. And then you would sign right here date and um, also do the print name. All right, that was a lot of information. And I know that there could be so much more that we go through, but I wanna make sure that we get through this in a timely way. Um, we're gonna go through the Emergency Economic Injury Disaster Loans. Um, this is a different program. It's a different program. Um, you can get very large loans, but what's special is that the uh, loan advance, the first $10,000 of that loan comes to you quickly. Typically, they're saying that it should be to you within three days of application. And it also, it also does not have to be repaid. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, this is where you can apply. I'm going to actually show you how to apply. Before, with the PPP loan program, remember, that has to go through a bank. This is different. This you can actually do through the SBA website, which is great. And the amount of time that it would take you to fill out this is probably four to five minutes. It's really quick and easy to apply for. But know that um, the calculations I'm seeing is that if you are eligible for a $250,000 loan through PPP and you do this, that that PPP loan would be reduced to $240,000. So that's what I'm seeing. Um, Again, I think the challenge is, is that things are changing so quickly and not all of these things are in ink that is dried. Things tend to keep on moving. Um, but again, this is particularly for the person who needs cash quickly and knock on wood, should be paid to you within three days. Um, the other thing that's important is that you can't use this $10,000 and your PPP loan to pay for the same expenses. They have to be different expenses. So that's the other thing that I'm seeing that they're talking about. So this is the application. Um, I know that you need pretty much um, a microscope to be able to figure this one out and see it. Um, so I, I made it a little bit larger, but essentially you're verifying that you have no more than 500 employees. Um, you know, you're, you're just saying, I qualify, that I qualify, which um, for the majority of people, they, they do qualify. So this is all the information here. And so you're gonna essentially, um, also here you're going to uh, verify that you're not engaged in illegal activity. Um, you're gonna make sure that, um, actually this is important, that individuals are not delinquent on child support obligations. That's uh, something that is not necessarily part of uh, the PPP program that is for this too. So you'll want to read through all of this. And, and that's literally, that's it. That's, that's it, that's how you apply for that one. It's, it's very quick and easy. 
Now, that being said, you probably have a million questions more. Um, so I wanted to give you the website for the SBA. And actually, um, we have one here. I'm down in Battery Park, so 26 Federal Plaza, I jog past there. Granted, it's at 5 in the morning, so I don't see it because it's so dark. Um, but it's uh, a great place for you to go to get your questions answered. They're open 8.30 to 5 p.m. Now, I get that you're worried about call volume. Um, I had a friend and she she called in and what she did is she just, she folded her laundry. <laughs> she did a few other things around the house, but she eventually got through and she called a couple times. The first time was 45 minutes, the next one was an hour, um, but this will be really helpful for you. And she said that she was very impressed with the level of knowledge and um, the helpful nature of everyone that was there. They're really here to help you. So. Um, Make sure that you reach out to them and they can give you all that information. So now we're gonna be talking about um, benefits for you as an individual, as well as for your employees that they should know about. Um, first off, we're gonna talk about unemployment insurance. We're gonna be talking about some rebate checks, as well as some other things that can help your business. Um, so most importantly, unemployment benefits have been extended much longer. Also, there's a higher benefit. So the normal benefit is increased by $600 a week. So that's $2,400 a month. It's quite, it's quite significant. Um, and also, this is really important. This is really important. Just as the PPP program was extended, as well as the emergency disaster loans, extended to individuals who were self-employed, gig economy, freelancers, independent contractors, guess what? Uh, for one of the first times in history, unemployment is now extended to you too. And you can be on unemployment and also apply for the PPP or emergency disaster loan. They're not mutually exclu exclusive. Um, make sure that if you apply for unemployment that you do it ASAP. Um, they're saying that they are hopefully going to get um, direct deposited within a couple weeks so you can get the money quickly and make sure that you take advantage of this benefit. Also, you should be getting a relief check. Uh, who doesn't like checks? Um, these checks, though, are going for the people who really need them. So if you're an individual and your adjusted gross income for 2019 was $75,000 or less, um, this for a lot of people have not filed their 2019s. So for you, if you've not filed your 2019, it's gonna be based on your 2018 AGI. Um, so if you are an individual and your AGI is below that amount, you're going to get $1,200. If you're married, um, it'll be $2,400. If you have a child, if you have a child, you'll get $500 per child, which I will tell you, we're doing homeschooling. This is our, uh, we've done four weeks of homeschooling so far. And I personally feel like we need more than $500 per child. I should be getting at least 1000 but I get, I get that. Um, so 90%, it's estimated about 90% of us will be getting rebate amounts of some amount. But unfortunately, not everybody will be. And this is frustrating. So if your adjusted gross income in 2018 or 19 was above these limits, but you just lost your job, you aren't necessarily going to get those payments. So that's kind of a frustrating portion. And this is a, a chart, it's a little hard to see, but this is a single person married, a single person with no children. Um, and so up until $75,000, uh, $75, they get 100% of the benefit of that $1,200 check. But then you can see by the time they reach 100,000, there's gonna be no benefit for them. There's gonna be no benefit. So what ends up happening is for every additional $100 that you make above that 75,000 adjusted gross income for single individuals, your benefit goes down by $5, so eventually it's exhausted. It's not a bad thing, to be honest, because they're really trying to get these checks in the hands of individuals who need them. Now, if you made a lot in 2018 and a whole lot less in 2019, so much so that you might qualify for this, try and get your 2019 tax return in as soon as possible. Also, if your child was dependent on you in 2018 and they now are independent for 2019 and they're their own taxpayer, then try and get them to do their tax return so they get their $1,200 check. Otherwise, you can get them as a dependent for 2018, but you're only going to get $500, right? So there's some strategy here. Required minimum distributions are going to be suspended. 
Um, so if you're a, over age 70 and a half, um, you're not going to need to take this out, uh, which is good. Um, also, if you need to invade your IRA, your 401k, your employer-sponsored retirement plan, and you've been impacted by the coronavirus in a negative way, you've lost your job, you've had to stay home and take care of children because they can't go to school, you're taking care of a family member uh, who has the disease or is sick, or you yourself, um, you've had your salary reduced, or you've been furloughed, or you are uh, have been let go, you are able to take advantage of this. And what's really special about it is that you can take up to $100,000 out and you don't have to pay the 10% penalty. Because if you remember, under age 59 and a half, if you were to take this out in other times, that $100,000 you'd have to pay a 10% penalty, you'd have to pay $10,000 in penalties. Now you're also gonna owe taxes, but what's interesting is they're letting you pay taxes over three years. So if you take 75,000 out, you pay taxes on 25,000 in 2021, um, sorry, it's 2020, you know, another 25,000, you pay the taxes the next year and then the year after. Um, if you don't wanna pay taxes, then what you can do is try and get that money back in there, but you have three years to do it. So if you take that $75,000 out, you have three years to return that money um, as well, which is a good thing to try and boost your retirement. If you have a retirement plan at work, a 401k, um, you can take out up to $100,000. So before it was 50,000. It was 50,000 was the maximum amount. Um, now you can take out up to $100,000 and you don't have to repay that loan that you are taking from yourself for an entire year. So again, what they're trying to do is they're trying to offer as much liquidity to Americans as possible. And also, for employers, um, we have to pay employer taxes, so that's Medicare and Social Security taxes on the paychecks of all of our employees. And what they're saying is that you don't have to do that for year 2020. You can defer that and delay payment, and you can pay half of it in 2021 and then the other half in 2022. Um, there's a lot of little small things to know, and one of them is that if you're taking advantage of the PPP loan program, you cannot also defer your payroll taxes. So just so you know. Um, modifications for net operating losses. Um, so essentially, if a business has losses, it allows you to benefit from them ASAP today, there's a lot of detail about that, but if you have losses, um, definitely talk to your accountant about this because you're going to be able to get, hopefully, benefits from that ASAP today. Um, and then also modifications on limited, uh, uh, limitation of deductible interest expenses. Essentially, they're increasing the ability to deduct certain interest expenses for businesses, which is good. All right, so I know we have gone through a lot um, <laughs> in 59 minutes. Um, the biggest thing is, Take a loan, a PPP loan, if, if that is right for you, take it for the amount that you think you need, right? Um, and don't borrow any more. Understand what your expenses are. That's really important. And if you do need a loan, th the goal is to do this immediately. You need to do this as soon as possible. So, um, Maggie, I just want to throw it out to you to see if you have any questions um, that I might be able to answer. I can take a couple if there's been a few that have come in. If not, okay. um, I, um, I'm happy to give my um, email address to you and so that you have all of that information so you can email me. And um, I will tell you that I've been like... I've been eating this for breakfast for the last week. There's so much to know, uh, but I, I have to say I don't know everything, but I will do the best I can to get you the answer or at least send you in the direction of the right resources because I think what's really unfair about, about these provisions is that the people who are going to benefit most are the people who have accountants who can walk them through this process and a lot of us a lot of us don't we do our own quickbooks we may even do our own taxes and we're you know we're really blind and there's so much information it's so overwhelming and that's just 
that's not right. This should be for everyone. This should be for everyone. And, you know, if anything, the people who don't have the lucrative funds to be able to buy, you know, services or be able to, um, you know, pay for high priced accountants need this, you know, even more, even more. Mm -hmm. Well, first, Stacey, I just want to say thank you. And there are a lot of messages here in the chat that this was so helpful. And thank you for really explaining everything clearly. So thank you again for really taking the time to go through everything. And if you do have time for, I, I see we had a couple questions coming, so maybe we can see how much time we have to, yep, yep. to go through just a couple. All right. So the first one is asking if the cost of payroll service is included. I believe that was back during the PPP. Yes. Um, so the cost of the service, no. No. Uh, that is not going okay. to be, um, unfortunately, th that I know of. Okay. Um, the next question was asking if you could touch on what all this means for S Corp, where there may not be an official payroll. Would the loan calculation be based on gross revenues to the S Corp? So, um, your accountant can take you through this because being an S Corp, you most likely have an accountant. Um, but they they do wherever you are in your tax return listing the income of the business. And for some people, like a solopreneur, um, you have your income minus your expenses, and you know what's left over. What's left over is actually considered your income. So your tax return. Um, will show you what the income is. For se several business entities, it flows through to the individual and it's on your personal tax return. And that could be the case for you too. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to also check with my accountant for you to get you that an information. And I do wanna share with anyone, um, I'm gonna try and make myself available these next couple days just to just to be here for you. I'm supposed to be quote unquote vacation, but um, I'm not sure how anyone takes a vacation in these times. And to be honest, I'm not sure, would the vacation be spent in my kitchen? Uh, would it be spent in, you know, the kids' room? I'm not so sure. It's not really a fancy vacation since you're, you know, we're, we're essentially uh, quarantined right now. Um, but, but I'm gonna be making myself available. So my email is Stacy S-T-A-C-Y, at Francis, financial.com s-t-a-c-y at francisfinancial.com um, i am getting dozens of emails right now um, just from you know other professionals um, other business owners but i will do everything i can to get your answer as quickly as possible okay great and we will send that email address out if you weren't able to write it down so we'll, we'll send this recording as well as stacy's email address so thank you so much stacy for offering to help everyone today so I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and thank you so much, Cece. It was really, really excellent, and I'm seeing more messages just thanking you again for all this helpful thank you. information. And, you know, Maggie, I'm going to ask all of the women that are listening here today to do something for me. Um, what I want you to do is please, please reach out to your friends, your loved ones, your colleagues who might be freelancers, might be gig economy, might be business owners, to let them know about this. Because as we talked about, time is of the essence, and so few people really understand that they can benefit from this. And this is what's going to keep America clicking and going to keep America so that when we come back, that we are able to come back and recover from this. Small businesses are the fabric. They are the fabric of what makes America run and we've got to protect our small businesses so please 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 um, we'll send you the recording but um, make sure that your friends and family and colleagues and anyone you know that has a heartbeat that you care about knows about this mm -hmm. absolutely yes all right well thank you thanks Stacy thanks everyone thank for you. joining all us right. All right. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.